Yeah, as Nathan was saying, I will be starting here in September, but now I'm a postdoc in, in Princeton. So I'm one of those uh, physicists that Bill Viale was saying yesterday that works in a biology department there. And um, the idea that I have uh, for, for these uh, lectures is to, to give you a, a brief overview of the kind of models that we can, um, that we can, that we can use and we actually often use when we are trying to model some of the problems that Bill Viale was introducing yesterday. And of course, I want to keep them simple and I want to be able to do most of the things in the Blackboard. So the models are gonna be probably the simplest ones that you can uh, find, but from them, usually the way this works is that from these simple models, you add more complicated things and at some point, you move from the Blackboard to the computer and you try to, to figure out the way of, of working with them. So, um, the main objective that these models have is to, to explain how these emergent phenomena that we uh, were, that you learned about yesterday, how they emerge in these biological systems. So the risk, I mean, the mechanism by which they emerge is by these interactions that are happening in, in biological systems. So biological systems are very complex. They have a lot of uh, different entities that can be cells, can be larger animals like mammals, birds, plants, interacting with each other, interacting usually also with an external environment that sometimes is stochastic, so these systems are very complicated. And the way I'm gonna be thinking about these emergent phenomena for these lectures is as any phenomena that is observed at a level of a population, so at a large level, and it's uh, rooted on these individual level interactions. And I'm gonna discuss mostly two problems. The first one is gonna take two lectures, and the second one is gonna take the second two lectures. Um, the only thing, so before we start, uh, please ask me as many questions as you want at any time, and either here in the lectures, in the coffee breaks, whenever you find it uh, the right time. And first quick question, how many of you uh, have taken any biology course after high school? Okay. Uh, in high school? Ah, that's good. Well, I... <laughs> So I'm not assuming that you know any biology, right? And well, I'm actually assuming two things. The first one is that we all will agree that uh, individuals reproduce. Okay, living beings reproduce and eat. We all agree, right? And the second one is that sometimes they move. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes they don't, but most of the times they, they do. And from, them, from there, we are gonna construct these models that I was saying before that actually are, um, even if you don't have like a strong interest in biology, uh, you may find them useful because they appear in many other fields. I'm gonna try to make these connections as well so you can connect maybe with fields that you, feel more, you find more interesting. And at the end, what we're gonna construct is a formalism to understand uh, a series of problems. One of them are these biological problems. So the first uh, problem that we're gonna discuss is the, uh, is to me, one of the most uh, interesting ecological problems, and it's uh, biodiversity in a small picture. So why, when we go out there, we found so many different uh, species coexisting in a very, very small space? So for instance, if you go to a forest and you see different types of trees coexisting with different types of animals and with microbes that we don't even see, or even if we go just out there and we pick some, some soil and we are able to figure out how many different uh, species are coexisting in a very, very small sample of soil. It's a huge different uh, amount of, of diversity in that small system. So we're gonna try to understand why these species that in principle they are interacting with each other, they are fighting for space, they are fighting for the same food, for light. How is it possible that they at some point are all together in the same place? And to start framing that problem, I want to get you back to the 30s, so a long time ago last century, uh, when there was a, a guy called Gauss that did a very, very simple experiment. So what he did was taking some yeast, which are a unicellular organism, a very important one. Um, it does, uh, well, I don't know if how many of you know what yeast does. So it's responsible of very, very important things, so for instance, uh, bread, beer, wine, and um, I mean, it's a unicellular organism that does some, uh, some important things. But anyway, what he did was taking two different species of yeast, 
separately. And first, he put them in a, in a medium where they had food to grow and allowed them to grow for a time. And every few hours, he was measuring how many cells did he uh, have in this, in, this, in this small tube. So this is what I'm trying to represent here with these black dots. For one of the species, what he found is that for a while, the number of cells was, was growing. The y-axis is volume of, of cells. So basically, what percentage of the tube is occupied by cells, if you want to. And he observed that for a while, this was increasing. And then eventually, this was uh, saturating. The growth was saturating. And then he took another species. He repeated the same thing. And he observed for the yellow, for the yellow curve that uh, the same kind of pattern, the same trend. First, some growth, and eventually a saturation in the growth. So this first very, very simple experiment is with each of them separately. So first one, then the other one. And we're not mixing them so far. So the question that we have uh, as mathematicians, physicists, or whatever you want to call it is, what are the mechanisms that are, what's happening in this tube that is giving me this pattern? So we are going to try to make a very, very simplified picture of, of what we think is happening there. We're going to try to put that into equations, and we're going to see uh, how far we can get. So the way uh, we will start thinking about this is, well, we have, I said we have a tube. So we are going to build our tube, because we are physicists. It's a spheric or circular tube. And inside the tube, we have the cells. Again, because they are growing in a liquid media, uh, they are very well shaped, so they are all over the place. We are not going to care so far. We are going to go eventually into that, and we are going to see what happens when we introduce this space. But for now, we are going to keep this as simple as we can, and we are going to assume that they are all over the place. They, are, they have access to nutrients everywhere, and they, we don't have a space. We only have these cells. So what do you think is, uh, is happening here? What are these cells doing? OK. So we can write that in terms of uh, some kind of reaction. So let's say that A are our cells. And we can say that if we have one cell, one of the processes that we have is that one cell divides and gets two cells. And that's uh, something that is happening randomly with some, it's a stochastic process. We don't know when that's happening. But we kind of get a sense of the temporal scale at which that, that's happening. So we can say that this reproduction event is happening with some rate that we can call it B. The rate is nothing else but the probability per unit time of some stochastic process that we don't know when it's happening to, to happen. So what else is happening here? If we assume that they have a lot of food, in principle, they shouldn't starve, right? They shouldn't eat because of lack of food, because they, we can say they have enough food. <laughs> but as the population grows, that food is becoming uh, more and more scarce. So eventually, we will have so many, so, so many uh, cells that we can say that they can find each other, and one of them dies. Right? At some point, there is the environment, the tube is so crowded of cells that they just don't have more food for everyone to grow, and they find each other, and they, they die. And we can say that that happens with uh, per capita rate B. So from these processes that are happening at some rate for every cell, we have to extrapolate that to the whole population. So we can assume that we have n cells in the system, and then the total rate at which this reproduction and death is happening can be, I mean, can be, uh, can be written. So if we have n cells, who can tell me what's the total rate at which we move from n cells to n plus 1 cell? B minus D? We are, uh, we are only working with, we're going to work with uh, reactions separately. So forget about this first reaction, only for this one. 
the total for the total population. What's the growth rate? Sorry? B times N? We all agree with that? OK. So we know that the rate that we can write, let's say, at which we go from N to N plus 1, it's B times N. So if we move from this state in which we have N cells to a state in which we have N minus 1 cells, Which one would be this rate? D times n? Any other option? Oh, now we have more, less consensus. It's more fun. So we have D times n here. Any other option? Sorry, I didn't understand. D times n? So who, OK, so let's think it carefully. We have N cells that can potentially die at the rate, day, at the rate D. Let's write it here, OK? But for this reaction to happen, for this death to happen, we need that cells need to find each other. They need to encounter each other, right? So it's not only that we need these, but we also need the, pro the probability of these cells that are uh, willing to die, if we want to say they can potentially die, to actually find another cell that will, um, that will trigger that reaction. And that's proportional to the, uh, the density of, of cells that we have around, right? Because uh, it's not only how many cells there are around me, but also how much, uh, I mean, in which space they are distributed, basically, the volume that is around. So we all agree on this at this point? OK. So just for, uh, to simplify a little bit things, um, I'm going to call D over V D tilde, and then, um, so I'm gonna, I can say D over B is equal to delta, and then we can forget about B. We really find the unit. Yes? So this is, uh, as we were saying in this reaction, this death, is there is, uh, is it depends on the on the concentration of cells around around you. So basically, when the medium is very diluted, you have a lot of food for you to grow and to reproduce without any problem. But as more and more cells are around you are in this in the same environment, then they are consuming more resources and they introduce like a pressure for that resource that is uh, makes this death more uh, probable. Yeah, just to take a first store. I mean, because you can imagine that the, I mean, the more cells you need to meet is like a higher order process, right? So in principle, it's more likely that two cells, uh, I mean, if, if three are finding each other, then first two have to, yeah. right? Okay, so now we have uh, our transition rates from having, I mean, the rates at which this population goes from n cells to n minus 1, to n minus 1 and to n plus 1. So because this is an, this is an stochastic process, we are working with something that happens with, rate, with some rate. It's not a deterministic dynamics. The, the, the way that we can describe the, the, the state of this system is by the probability distribution. And the probability distribution, yes. Well, we, because we assume that uh, these processes happen on a very short time. So basically, on this very, very short time step, only one process can happen. I don't know if that was your question. So basically, uh, we take these uh, time steps small enough, so we only observe one process each time. Okay? 
So we need to write an equation, as we were saying, for a probability distribution. What's the probability distribution that is interesting for us at this point? The probability of having n cells at time t, right? In principle, if we know that, if we know what's the probability of having n cells at time t, I, I know everything about the system. <coughs> so, to see how this probability distribution uh, evolves in time, we basically, we, I mean, we just can say that the probability of having n cells at time t plus dt, and here this dt is this small time step that I was saying before, we are gonna observe the system on very, very small uh, time steps. What is this probability equal to? Sorry? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is, uh, okay, so basically the probability of measure of having n cells in a future time is equal to the probability of having n minus one and one cell is reproducing, plus the probability of having n, mus one, n, n plus one and one is dying, plus the probability of having n and nothing is happening. And this is what we are uh, writing here. And because we were saying that dt is very, very small, we can rewrite this and we can uh, we get that the probability of having n cells at t plus dt minus the probability of having n cells at time t divided by dt is equal to this term and to simplify the notation I'm going to call uh, this rate omega plus and this rate Omega minus, omega minus. Uh, plus the probability of having n plus one cells down. Omega minus. Okay, so we have now, and of course because dt is very small, uh, this is the uh, derivative of p n t over t. So what we have now is a Differential equation for the probability distribution of, uh, of the population size. And this is called a master equation. And it's basically the uh, fundamental equation for a stochastic system. So whenever you have a stochastic system, here we are, we are working with a population growth, but you can think of uh, radioactive decay, other biological processes, like for instance, uh, um, RNA transcription or chemical reactions. So whenever you have a system that has these transition rates, if you are able to write a master equation and you are able to solve this master equation, which is the tricky part, you know everything about that system. You know the probability, the, the, the distribution, the PDF for, for the variable that you are, uh, in which you are, in terms of which you are describing the system, and in principle, you know everything about that system. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. Minus um, uh, 
And this is, of course, gamma minus n plus 1, and this is. Okay. So the notation is basically uh, the subscript is giving me whether I'm moving upwards or downwards in the number of particles. And here is the number of particles or the cells that we have. So as I was saying, if we have an initial condition for this master equation, we, in principle, we should know how many cells we had in the beginning. And we're able to integrate this equation. We know, uh, we know everything about this stochastic dynamics. <coughs> so for this particular problem, because it's a very easy one, it's a very simple one, you can solve this master equation. There are ways of solving it. I'm not going to go into this today. Uh, but usually you don't, I mean, you, you cannot. It's, uh, solving master equations is, is, is tricky. And what you do is try different uh, approximations in order to get some information. One of the approximations that we are going to see today is to basically try to get rid of the fluctuations and keep the deterministic dynamics to see uh, how the mean values the, or in general, the moments of this distribution uh, change with time. Uh, another thing that people, I mean, that you can do is to simulate this with a computer to see how this looks like. So there are many ways of, of working with this, with this master equation. Uh, the one, the one we are going to discuss is uh, getting rid of fluctuations, going into the the moments of the distribution to the first moment, indeed, and see what can we learn from from that. So, <clears throat> for uh, how? Yes. So I'm assuming that dt is small enough, so I only observe one process each time. I'm neglecting like dt square terms in this. this uh. So if we have an, yes? So this, this third term, isn't it the two processes? Like uh, you have n cells and it goes, goes up and goes down? No, this is, I have n cells and it, it remains. So that term okay. would be, the one that you have in mind would be uh, multiplying both, both rates because you need two things to happen. And then it will be dt square. And we assume that you can neglect this dt square against dt. So if we have an stochastic variable, for us is the number of cells. Uh, what's the, I mean, you all have taken, I guess, uh, like a probability course or this, do you all know what's the moments of what the moments of the distribution are? Okay. <coughs> so which one would be uh, the uh, the first moment of a distribution is the mean value. The second moment of the distribution is the uh, okay. So we are on the same page. And for a discrete variable. This is the definition of the moments of the distribution. So as I was saying, we are interested in the deterministic part of the dynamics, so I'm going to work with the mean value. So k equal to 1. So if we want to calculate this thing, what we can do is we can multiply the two sides of the master equation by n to the power of k, in this case, to by, by n, and then we can sum over, over n.
Okay, so I've done nothing but uh, multiplying by n both sides and then adding up from zero to infinity. So we can already, I mean, um, in the left side we can already identify that I mean we can we can uh, exchange the order of the derivative of and the and the and the sum. So we basically already have here the derivative of the mean value. And here we have uh, for, for for these other terms we have uh, we have some problems. Because as you can see, this uh, probability is uh, is a probability of having n minus one, and here we have n, right? So we have to, in order to have some mean value here, we need we need to have a p of n in in all the in all the terms. So how can we how can we do that? How can we uh, fix that? Any idea? So we can say that n minus one. I'm going to do that uh, here. We can say that n minus 1 is m. So in principle, then n is m plus 1. And then if n is equal to 0, then in terms of m, the sum goes from 1 to infinity. And then I have m. m plus 1, probability m of at time t, uh, gamma plus at m. So now I have the probability the p of m that I want, and I have m minus m plus 1 here. So uh, in principle, this, this sum goes from 1 to infinity instead of from 0 to infinity. But if I take um, if I take uh, m, so basically the the way these transition rates work allow me to take the m equal to zero term is equal to, to the transition to that term is zero. So I can in principle extend this this sum from zero to infinity, and then I have basically what I wanted. I have in terms of another index that now I can call it n because it's a it's a it's it's an index I can call it whatever I want, and I can just rewrite all the terms in terms of uh, in terms of this new index, and they will go actually from zero to infinity, and they will depend on the probability at uh, of having n particles instead of n mass minus one and n plus one. So if we would do that, what we get is. Uh, So here I've uh, um, collapsed two steps. Basically what I've done is to rewrite the, indis the indices, and then I, uh, su I substituted the uh, transition rates by uh, their actual expressions. So we save some time. You can, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. They, uh, thank you. 
So there is uh, an approximation that I, uh, I forget to, to do is that uh, in this transition rate, because we have a lot of individuals, we have a lot of cells, we can approximate n minus one by n, and then this rate is delta n squared. Okay, that's, uh, <laughs> that's another thing that I, I am assuming here, sorry. Okay, thank you. So how can we, uh, what else can we, can we do with, with this equation? So now uh, we can, I mean, we have here uh, B times N times N, and here we have the same term with the different signs. So this basically, this first terms goes, term goes out with this one, and the same for this one, where we have uh, delta times uh, N squared times N, N times delta times N squared, these ones, these two go, go out, so then basically we have So this is what we have once we do all the, all the terms go out and we use the definition of the mean to, to rewrite the, the equation. So we have an equation for the evolution of the mean value of the mean population size that depends on the mean population size, but it also depends on the mean value of, of n square. And in principle, we, uh, we wanted a close equation for a mean value of, of, of the population size, right? And actually, if you now redo all the calculations, and that's a, a good exercise to do to, to really see that we have understood all the, uh, all the indices and all the ways of, of working with this equation, if you repeat all this equation but for k equal to 1, all this derivation, you will get a differential equation for the mean value of n squared that we will, will be coupled to the cubic term. And if you were the cubic term, it will be coupled with the fourth order. And then you have like an infinite hierarchy of coupled ordinary differential equations for the moments of the distribution. So in principle, we've done something, but we don't have a closed description for the deterministic dynamic as, as we want. So the most, uh, there are some ways of approximating this uh, this term and try to, to, to and get a close description of the system, uh, the one that we are going to follow is what is called the mean field approximation that basically is assuming that uh, that the mean value of the square of a square n is equal to the uh, square of the mean. So basically neglecting the fluctuations. Okay, so we are going to assume that this is actually equal to uh,
And then with, uh, with this, the, uh, we get... Uh, we get what we wanted that is a closed equation for the deterministic part of the dynamics of the system, okay? So, of course, it's very interesting to also write an equation, I mean, to forget about this mean field approximation, and we can stop, for instance, in k equal to two, and then we cut this hierarchy of equations at k equal to two, and then we also have information about the fluctuations, and we have a more detailed description of the system, but so far, we are gonna keep things deterministic, and see what we learn from the deterministic part of the, of the system, okay? Questions so far? Okay. So now we have, uh, in principle, a nonlinear differential equation because it has uh, this uh, quadratic term there. And there are many things that we can do with these equations. What is the first thing that you would try to do? Factor, like write the rate in terms of, uh, of the mean of n? You mean dividing by the mean value? Yeah, then you get an equation for the growth rate per, per capita, for instance. That would be one thing to do. Something else? No one would, that's one more thing, yeah? No one would try to solve it? <laughs> I'm just asking if someone would try to solve the equation. Because that's the first thing I would try. Okay. A, a, a separable... this, yeah, this one can be solved, okay? So that's why it's always worth try to solve it. Because nonlinear differential equations are most of the time not solvable, but this one it is. So first thing to do would be solve it. Actually, if you solve it, you get uh, the growth that I was showing you before. I, I deleted and the, that fits the data very well. I will show you tomorrow that result. So after solving it, let, let's, let's, okay, let's think that we are not able to solve it. What else can you do? Finding the fixed points? Linearizing. And also you can uh, try to solve it with a computer. You can solve it with paper and, and pencil or with a computer, like numerical, trying to integrate it numerically to see how these uh, growth curves go. So let's find the, uh, the, stable, the, the steady states of the, of the equation. So, Let's try to find the point where I'm going to get rid of these, uh, of the angles. Let's try to find the points where the derivative of the population gets, uh, it's equal to zero, okay? So this is, uh, is it to do one is n equal to zero, which means that we don't have anything, we don't have any cell, everyone has die out. And the other one is uh, b minus dn equal to zero, and then n is equal to b over D. So we have one trivial fixed point, and we have a non-trivial fixed point that is telling us that the population will reach some finite value. This is, this is called the, uh, the current capacity. And it's usually uh, used, K is used to, to to, to call this, this value. So it's very easy to see that the total number of cells that I will find at the end of my tube, it's going to depend on the growth rate per capita, so on, fast the, on how, fa how fast they grow, and it's going to depend on how strong they, they kill each other when they encounter. So we know that there are uh, two fixed points that in this case we can calculate them analytically. And someone was saying before linearizing the system, who was saying that? Why would you like to, to linearize the system? What do you wanna, what can you learn by linearizing the system? That's, that would be, that would be something good to know, right? I mean, just to say if everyone will die or not, I mean, maybe with, with GIST it's not that important, but if we have uh, another system, it's something that we would like to know. So let's linearize the system. And keep on looking for an eraser. 
Um, <clears throat> So to linearize the system, I will basically assume that I'm in the, uh, let's call n star, the steady states. I'm in the steady state, and I add some small perturbation with epsilon, right? So to try to keep things general, let's say that this is Fn. It's the population growth rate. So basically, I can, if I have F, Of course, the derivative of a fixed point is zero. What's the value of this? Zero. And then I have So how many of you have done this before? Just to get a sense of how far I can go, okay. So now we have a differential equation for the perturbation that I introduced. That is, uh, what would you do with this equation? Okay. <laughs> Has an exponential solution, no? The solution is proportional to the exponential of, okay. So what are we learning now from this Result. For those that haven't done this before, what do you think I'm learning from this? Okay, so depending on the derivative of f, if the derivative of f evaluated at the fixed point is positive, then the perturbation is going, is going to grow and then the system is unstable. And if the derivative of f is negative, then we have the other case. OK? And just to, um, to finish with this analysis, um, So this has been, uh, in principle, uh, easy, right? We solve the fixed points. We do some linear stability analysis. We see whether this is going to one side or the other. For the case of our problem, the derivative of f of n, it's uh, b minus 2 times um, times delta n. So if we put here n equal to 0, this is positive because b is positive. We assume that the growth rate is positive. So n equal to 0 is unstable. Okay. Whenever I have no cells, if I put 2 or 3, they will grow, which in principle makes sense. And if I put here the other fixed point, which is b over delta, Then I get minus b, which is negative, and the fixed point is stable. So if I'm, the population has saturated and I, keep, I re remove some cells, then they will grow again until that point. And if I add more cells, they will kill each other until they recover that point. OK, we all agree with this? OK. But now there is uh, the last question I'm going to ask you. 
what happens if we, what do you think it could happen if we have a system in which f of n is so complicated that I cannot find the fixed points? Numerical solutions is one thing, but if I give only, if I only give you a chalk, how would you try to do that? Do you guys think it would be possible to do something with that? You read the, you know? Yeah, we're going to, I mean, we can always do some, uh, some graphical analysis of how these curves look like. And even though we won't be able to know if the fixed point is 3, 4, 17, or whatever, we will at least know if there is a fixed point, if it is stable, if it is not, how the system will behave as, as we change a little bit things. And we will still get like some intuition on how the, the system is working. And that's, uh, that's, a, that's something that is very useful. We are going to introduce that for this system, in which in principle we don't need it because we have much more information from many other things, but we will need it later. So, we have f of n, the population growth rate, equal to b n minus. So which was the condition for the fixed point? That this growth rate has to be equal to zero, right? So in principle, if I, if I plot this curve here as a function of n, whenever this becomes zero, I have a fixed point. I don't know the value. I don't know if it's a b over delta or if it is whatever, but I know that if I plot this parabola, whenever it crosses the fixed point, the, sorry, the, the x-axis, it means that it's, getting, it's equal to zero and I have a fixed point. So I have two, I have zero and I have what I was calling before, k. Okay. Can we know something about the stability of these points? Well, actually, because this is, uh, this is the derivative of n, when the derivative is negative, with, when f of n is negative, I know that n is going to decrease. When it is positive, I know it's going to increase. Okay? And here, the same, because it's still positive. Here is negative. So what I know is that this fixed point is going to, is, is a stable. And usually when a sta fixed point is stable, you just uh, fill it. And I know this one is unstable. So with this technique, I don't know anything about the precise value of the, mean fi of the fixed point, but I know its stability and I know how many points I have. And I also know that depending on how I play with the parameters, this growth rate is going to change and the fixed points are going to be lost or some new ones are going to appear and, and so on. And uh, it's very important, uh, I mean, it's important for you to know that uh, in this case, we've been able to plot f of n, and it's more likely that we'll be able to plot this function than to find analytically the zeros. But sometimes it's a little bit hard also to, to find this uh, f of n. And there are, but there are other alternatives. So in this, when you're trying to do this graphical analysis, uh, there is an important component of, of, creativ of creativity of having ideas, right? So I don't know if any of you has another idea of how would you be able to find these fixed points and its stability when you are not able to, to plot f of n. Any idea? How would you rewrite this? I can say that this is equal to b times n equal. No? And I can. And then I have, again, two crossing points. Here, what I have is that the uh, b times n is larger than the parabola. So this is positive. 
So in principle, the system end will grow. Here I have a switch in which one is larger than the other. The system will go to, to this point, and here same, the same. And this is another alternative of getting this. Okay? And from here, maybe it's more, well, in this case, it's, I, I guess it's very easy to see it from both sides. But as you play with B and, and delta, you may like lose the crossing point, and here you may, of course, the parabola can go down. And so there are many, uh, depending on, I mean, this allows you to qualitatively learn how playing with the parameters you change the stability of this system. So this was, uh, I'm going to stop here for today. Uh, this is like a very simple analysis for a one population system. Remember that the motivation was that we had that, those growth curves. Uh, if you solve this equation, you may find a B and a delta that fit the experimental data very well. I'm going to show you that tomorrow in the, in the projector, although I think the presentation, I mean, some figures are uh, online. But now, uh, as I was uh, saying in the beginning, what we really want to know is why sometimes we, I mean, many times we have so many species all together, and that's what we are going to do tomorrow. So tomorrow we're going to see how we, how when we have, instead of one, we have two. We are not going to work with 300. How things change, how can we analyze, how, could, how can we formalize those problems into a mathematical model, how can we analyze those models, and what biology can we learn from there, okay? So I don't know if you have uh, more questions. Sorry, I forgot. Yeah. Do you have a close relation between the moments, suppose the k order moment and the, and the rest of them, so k plus one, k plus two, because that is the linear relation between the, the derivative in time of the the first moment and the second. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look that equation. Uh, yeah, so if you work. Linear, no? right? Can you write a close relation between the order? Two? So if you write uh, an equation for the second moment, which is the one that you need, uh, that's, a, that's actually a very good exercise that, um, that I recommend you to do. And if you have any problem with, I mean, I'm happy to, to help you with that. If you, write, if you write that equation, you will find that it depends on the third moment. If you write the one for the, the, third, the third. Only on the third. Fourth. But if you write for the third, it depends on the fourth. So they are coupled one by, I mean, k is coupled to k plus one, and at some point you have to close. I mean, you have to do some approximation to, to break that coupling. We, uh, we cut the hierarchy at k equal to one. But you can, I mean, it's very interesting to have k equal to two and see how the fluctuations work. So whether, uh, how the, the, the fluctuations in the population size depend on how many cells I have, on which parameter is more important than the other, and that's, uh, so, I mean, especially when population size are very small, fluctuations are more important than the de deterministic part, right? Because fluctuations go as one over the square root of, of n, and the, the deterministic part goes as n, so when, they, uh, when n is very small, the fluctuations are more intense than the deterministic part. So it's, I mean, for many things, it's very important to, to go to higher orders. I ask you this, this because if you had this close relation between the, the, the k moment and the k plus one, you could solve it analytically by diagonalizing those equations, yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah, 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 if you could, that yeah. The, the thing is, I mean, that's, that the thing is that in the, for this case, it's, uh, it's, um, it's infinite. If you don't cut it at some point, you never get a close, a close relationship. But for this system, I, I don't know if I said that, for this particular system, is the, the easiest one you can work with. You can even solve the master equation and you can get the distribution. Okay? Uh, yeah, what I forgot to say in the beginning is that there will be uh, some exercises. I will, they will be in the course webpage. They are not a lot, they are four. One is connected to each class, but I think it's very important that you at least try to do them, and if you have any problem, again, ask me, I will be the whole week, okay? So ask me, and they will be, I mean, it's the, the best way to test whether you've understood what we are talking here is if you really face the problems and try to solve them. They are not super, I mean, there are not a lot, because if you, I thought if you see 20 problems, maybe you don't even do one, 
So it's only four. Please try them, because it's going to help you. OK, thank you. <laughs>